Hello and welcome to a revision session looking at AQA GCSE history, life in Elizabethan times. Let's start by considering the so-called golden age of Elizabethan times. Firstly, we've got to consider the rise of a group called the gentry. Traditionally, the nobility had been the most powerful people in society. The gentry were slowly emerging as similar in power to the nobility. Nobility were people who were born into riches, who were inherit grand houses and titles like earl and baron um, and lady and lord. Members of the gentry, however, weren't born into riches. They became rich, usually through um, perhaps being a knight um, or an esquire, which means someone who worked in businesses. So they might trade um, with foreign empires, for example, and make a fortune uh, through slave trade, for example. Or they might perhaps be involved in trading goods uh, like cloth. Um, the gentry didn't make as much money as the nobility did, um, but they would make around £200 a year, uh, which was a significant amount of money. And it led to lots of changes. With this growing population of people who uh, had more money to spend, uh, more was done in terms of fashion and paintings and architecture than we'd seen in previous periods. Architecture in particular in this period is really interesting. There's lots of real change. Italian styles became very popular, so people moved away from the wattle and daub styles, which had been the sort of um, white and, and brown uh, wooden buildings and factories that we'd seen before to carved stone buildings. Um, things like the loggia were really popular, so open walkways and corridors which are outside and they were sort of surrounded by columned walkways. Um, it was a real visible way for people looking at your house to see that you had the most up-to-date Italian styles. It was a way of members of the gentry showing their new wealth and their new status. Um, other things that they used to show their new wealth and status included elaborate carving, so grand marble staircases or um, plaster, which is sort of like a white material uh, with really intricate stories and pictures and things on the walls. Uh, mullion windows were another way of showing your wealth and status. Um, they didn't have the ability yet to create large glass sheets, but mullioned windows are when you have really grand large windows with lots of little panes in them. Um, and grand houses like Hardwick Hall were said to have more glass than wall uh, as a way of showing wealth and status. Another invention which showed uh, new status was a long gallery. This replaced old uh, grand halls or main halls and it was a long thin uh, room which was designed for dancing and entertaining other guests. It was somewhere you could display and show off all your paintings um, and it's also somewhere where people could exercise. Other than the rise of the nobility, the other reason that there were new styles of architecture was actually uh, stability in England. Because there were less, well, there was less threat of a civil war breaking out as there had been in previous Tudor periods, uh, there was no longer a need for houses which were being built to be built with fortifications and things to defend themselves. They didn't need really thick brick or solid stone walls, uh, which meant that they were able to have more glass and more decoration and more money being spent on the decorative side of things than they had been in previous periods. So in this way, there is a sort of golden age in architecture, lots of new ideas being tried out that hadn't been tried out before. In terms of fashion, there's also some big changes, um, but this is more to do with showing loyalty to Elizabeth. Um, than it was to do with the more stable England. Lots of fashion was about imitating Elizabeth, for example, um, having red wig wigs or curled hair, um, or trying to have a body shape uh, similar to Elizabeth by having a bum roll, uh, so a sort of thick piece of material rolled around your waist to give yourself really big hips, uh, like Elizabeth liked to portray herself as having. Um, men would wear earrings, pearl earrings, which looked a little bit like the fashion that Elizabeth might be wearing. Um, it was fashionable to wear a ruff, as Elizabeth liked to wear one, uh, the sort of big uh, white uh, collars that they wore. Um, all of this was about showing loyalty to Elizabeth I. Um, it's also about showing status. So things like, for example, it became very popular to wear lead paint on your face to, to whiten it, to make it look like you didn't have to work outside. So that was another way of showing your status, if you had other people to work outside in the fields for you.
Um, and another reason, other than showing loyalty to Elizabeth, is with the stability of England, there was more money that people would spend on things like fashion than perhaps they had done before. Paintings, something else we see in the golden age of Elizabethan times. Um, largely, paintings were used very carefully to show propaganda, uh, to get to people to think uh, something in particular. So Elizabeth uses them like she puts her hand on a globe to show that she controls the world. Or you've got a beautiful um, painting showing eyes and ears all over Elizabeth's dress to show that she's all-seeing and all-knowing and all-hearing um, using her spy network that Walsingham led. But most people actually wouldn't use um, giant paintings and things. Largely as a the growth in miniature portraits, things that people had for personal use. Um, because of the stability of England, they had more money they could spend, perhaps a bit more frivolously. Um, people would have miniature, very detailed portraits painted of themselves or of their family members that they could see themselves. But this was for personal and not public use. So not all things in this golden age were about showing status to other people. Some of it was about having that new stability, which meant that they could spend money on other things, sort of new consumerism. We also see a growth in the theatre in Elizabethan times. Uh, initially, this actually happens as a result of a law that Elizabeth passes. Elizabeth's government were particularly worried about crime, um, it particularly ar arising around groups who were pickpocketing in streets in London. And one way in which people could draw large crowds and pickpocket was to have someone who was acting out a story. People would go and they'd be curious to see what was going on. So to stop this kind of crime, they passed a law to say that all actors had to belong to a particular company. You couldn't just be on the streets. And inadvertently, this led to the setting up of the very first theatres. Uh, it wasn't something they planned to do. It's something that happened as a result of them passing this law. Because people were forced to join a company or a group of actors, they decided they may as well uh, pool their money together or they'd have a rich uh, nobleman or a member of the gentry who would support them. Um, and they set up a particular place where that group could um, work together. So theatres grew. Actually, initially, this wasn't really what Elizabeth's government wanted because of the threat of the plague returning. But we know, for example, that it was there in Britain... In in 1665 and 1666. So actually, theatres were outlawed in London. They were banned from London. So most theatres were actually built below the River Thames, and still are, because of this. So theatres like the Globe and the Rose, for example. Um, the Globe is a particularly famous theatre that developed in Elizabethan times because it was run by Chamberlain's men, um, which included Shakespeare. And although initially... Uh, the setup of these theatres was unpopular due to the fear of the plague spreading. Uh, Elizabeth herself particularly enjoyed uh, the plays of these particular groups. These groups um, gained lots and lots of money um, through sort of return returning people coming back now that they knew where the theatres were and they could go back and see particular plays. Um, and they started to have sort of up to 3,000 people a week attending their performances. So very quickly we were able to invest in new props, uh, to invest in new parts of their buildings, uh, like the heavens above the stage where they could roll cannonballs around to create thunder and throw water down. Um, they often used cannons um, and fire, although in some cases this actually resulted in their theatres, including the globe, burning down. Uh, but all of these things made the theatre a more exciting place to go and to be. Elizabeth particularly enjoyed performances of groups like the Chamberlain's Men. Um, she would ask them to come and perform to her in her royal court as opposed to going to the theatre herself. Um, and she saw, and as did the members of the Privy Council, a way to use the theatre as a form of propaganda. So, for example, plays like Hamlet reinforced the idea of the great chain of being, that everyone has their place in society and that no one should go against it or question it. Uh, for example, Hamlet, uh, when he kills the king, ends up going mad. Uh, you've also got things like Richard III um, being shown as an evil villain. Uh, Richard III had been fighting against her grandfather, Henry VII, um, and the play is all about showing um, Richard III as being evil and Henry VII and the Tudors as being the rightful heirs to the throne. So theatre was a really useful way for Elizabeth and her government to reinforce the idea that Elizabeth was the rightful person to be on the throne and that no one should question it or go against it. Another real reason that life in Elizabethan times was seen as a golden age is because of exploration. 
new inventions made exploration possible in the Elizabethan period. For example, things like lateen sails. Um, they were sort of triangular shaped sails as opposed to the older traditional square sails and they allowed faster and easier methods of steering and it meant that travel could be more exact. Um, also we've got things like the astrolabe being invented which made it easier to navigate. It's a sort of very complex form of a compass. Um, so between these two things, the teen sails and astrolabes, um, it was possible for people to be more exact with their navigation. However, it was still very dangerous. Um, exploration wasn't uh, without problems, uh, including pirates or privateers from other countries stealing goods uh, that perhaps traders or other privateers and pirates themselves might be carrying on their ships, as well as the danger of um, weather. Many six ships would sink as a result of big thunderstorms. Uh, for example, Francis Drake, one of the most famous explorers we'll look at in a minute, um, had many of his ships destroyed whilst he was trying to circumnavigate the globe, which means go around the globe. One of the early uh, explorers who had a real impact on El El life in Elizabethan times was R Ralph Fitch. Um, he travelled to India in 1582 and um, he came back and told Elizabeth that India would be a really good place to trade with. And although it's right at the end of her reign when uh, this actually happens, uh, Ralph Fitch was the reason that the East India Company was set up in 1600, which brought back new products like silk and spices and porcelain to uh, England, which was really significant. These are real new products. They were things that England could trade with other countries, uh, and it ends up setting them up for in, in the, ne the centuries to come, uh, having a really uh, wealthy uh, country and a wealthy empire that goes with it. However, Ralph Fitch was certainly not the most significant explorer um, in the Elizabethan period. Francis Drake uh, was particularly significant. Um, he was a privateer. This was a name that Elizabeth gave to him or a role that she allowed him to have, which meant that he was secretly allowed to go and raid Spanish ships. Um, and uh, whilst he was going out and raiding Spanish ships, most of which were in South America because they had set up uh, various colonies there, um, he also ends up accidentally circumnavigating or going all the way around the world for the first time. It takes him several years, from 1577 to 1580, during which time people actually believe perhaps he might have died and that he's not going to return. But when he does eventually return successfully, he brings back £10,000 worth of gold and 26 tonnes of silver, which was more than the ordinary annual income that Elizabeth had. Um, and he gave about a third of that to Elizabeth and ends up being knighted by Elizabeth in 1581 for his services to the Queen. Um, he particularly impacts the England's relationship with Spain, um, partly because obviously he'd been raiding Spanish ships, uh, but also because when he was circumnavigating the globe uh, and ran into these various Spanish ships which he attacks, he learns quite a lot about their battle tactics and brings that back and uses it um, when later on England is going to war with Spain as part of the, um, the Armada. Uh, in 1586 he destroyed 30 to 40 Spanish ships at Cadiz, so he had a really good understanding of how uh, the Spanish ships worked. But he's also one of the key reasons why Spain ends up declaring war against Britain. Um, he was wanted by the Spanish and they actually uh, offered about 20,000 uh, ducats if someone was to bring him back dead to them or alive, which is equivalent to about $4 million in today's money. So um, he was particularly instrumental in damaging relationships between uh, England and Spain. Another really key individual, and actually Sir Francis Drake's cousin was uh, John Hawkins. John Hawkins uh, is significant in terms of Elizabethan exploration and Elizabethan life because he was the person who first um, initiated England into the slave trade. He was the first person in England to complete the entire transatlantic um, slave trade process, travelling from Britain to um, West Africa, from West Africa to America, and then America back to Britain again. Um, he introduced new products like tobacco to England, which obviously in the long term hasn't been particularly successful, but did cause a huge increase in wealth into Britain. And he was also another um, naval leader, uh, raiding Spanish ports and causing bad relationships with Spain, but not as significant as um, Francis Drake. <laughs> 
Um, he, he never had a price on his head from the Spanish, for example. Another really key individual who was involved in exploration in the Elizabethan period is Sir Walter Raleigh. Um, he was not as important as uh, Francis Drake, largely because he was very unsuccessful. Um, he was sent out to South America, or, sorry, North America, by Elizabeth to try and set up a colony, an area of land ruled by England. Um, in 1584 she sends him out. The idea is that he can explore, take ownership of land, and then bring a fifth of the treasure back to Elizabeth. And she's very excited about the prospect of this making England just as powerful as Spain and France and the Netherlands, and hopefully making a lot of money. Uh, however, the two attempts that Sir Walter Raleigh made failed miserably. For example, Roanoke, which was sent, set up in 1587, um, Sir Walter Raleigh doesn't actually go out to run the colony himself. He sends someone else in his place, John White. Um, John White then also returns himself to the UK, and when he returns, uh, finds that all of the people that he'd left there have gone, as have any sort of sign of them being there, and the only thing that they found as any evidence that there was anyone there was the word Croatone, the name of a local tribe carved into a tree. So they think potentially um, the local uh, English people were killed by local tribesmen. Uh, if we reflect on these things, it's possible to see that actually, although many steps forward were made in exploration in the Elizabethan period, perhaps there wasn't such a golden age. Compared to other European countries, they didn't have the colonies, they didn't have quite as much wealth, uh, and they certainly weren't the first to be involved in things like the slave trade um, or trade with um, India. So actually, um, the idea of the golden age in terms of exploration is more a product of propaganda than it was a reality. The last and most important aspect of life in Elizabethan times that we need to consider is uh, the poor in Elizabethan times. There was a huge increase in poverty uh, during Elizabethan times and there are several reasons for this that it's very important you're aware of. Firstly, there's changes in farming methods that had started to happen under um, other Tudors such as Henry VIII. Um, and enclosure was where ordinarily there had been lots of little farms and most people had a small area of land that they were in charge of and could make money from. Enclosure was a process started up by the government which meant that more food and more goods and crops were created overall in Britain which is where smaller farms were all joined up to be one big farm um, in each local area so you ended up with lots of big farms instead of uh, thousands of small farms across England. This was really good for the general country and for the government because more food was being produced, but it was bad for many of the small farmers who lost their jobs. Instead of, in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven farmers having a small area of land and a job, you just have one farmer in charge of this area of land instead. So um, there was lots of unemployment. Another reason for unemployment uh, was a new law that Henry VII, um, Elizabeth's grandfather, had introduced that Elizabeth continued as well, uh, which limited the number of people that you could have in a private army. So, for example, in each um, local area, Lord Lieutenant, like the Earl of Essex or the Duke of Norfolk, um, wasn't allowed to have a standing army or not a large standing army. And traditionally, this had been a large source of employment as well. So enclosure and the new law about limited numbers of people in private armies meant lots of people were out of jobs and that caused poverty. Another thing, a sort of a legacy of other Tudors which had caused increased poverty was the closure of monasteries. Henry VIII, as you know, broke away from the Catholic Church and as a part of doing that he closes down the Catholic monasteries where nuns and monks had lived. Um, the nuns and monks... Uh, as you'll know from Medicine Through Time, I'm sure, um, offered m charity and they ran the hospitals and things like that. So the closure of the monasteries also, and the sort of break away from the Catholic Church, um, meant that there was less help on offer uh, than there had been in uh, the medieval period. So there's a, an increase in poverty because of the closure of monasteries and abbeys as well. Population increase is another key reason why poverty increased in the Elizabethan period. Uh, it went from 2.8 million to around 4 million, um, and the death rate decreased. Um, so with more people in England, um, the 
area of land or ability to own an area of land where you could live or a property where you could live uh, decreased. So landlords saw a, an opportunity to raise their rents. There were more people than there were places to live. So landlords knew that they could hike up their rents and people wouldn't have any choice. They would have to pay it, otherwise they would end up homeless. This is known as rack renting. Um, so landlords were trying to sort of um, get in on the population increase and, and make a lot of money out of it. Uh, on top of this, we had things like the flu. Around 200,000 people were killed in a flu epidemic in 1556. Uh, there was the plague uh, later on in uh, the 1600s, which is... Um, and there's a series of bad harvests as well. In 1594 to 1598, um, food prices increased. There were shortages um, and starvation as a result. And as food, uh, as there's less food because of bad harvest, the price of that food goes up. Uh, and not only that, we've got large numbers of people who are earning less than they were before or even out of a job. Uh, so large numbers of people die of starvation. Elizabeth felt it was her duty to help the poor, especially because there's this huge increase in poverty. And part of the reason for that was the idea of the great chain of being. This was the idea that everyone had their place in society and those at the top, like God and the Queen or the King, had a duty to help those below them. So therefore, Elizabeth I felt she should help the, uh, the poor who were deserving. And there were these two types of poor that they saw. There was the undeserving poor, people who they saw as beggars, liars, idle, uh, lazy, people who could have actually made a living and were choosing not to in the eyes of Elizabeth and her government. Uh, people like, they called it the bear top trickster, a lady who would go around and flash people and try and steal their money, or clapper dungeons, um, or the tomo bedlams, people who pretended to be mad or pretended that they weren't able to have a job when actually they were, and a group of people who Elizabeth and her government classed as being the deserving poor, people who were perhaps able-bodied and unable to find work because of enclosure, for example, or people who'd been injured or were ill or orphans or were too old to find work anymore. And these people uh, were seen as deserving, and therefore, uh, as a result of the great chain of being, Elizabeth and her government felt that they had uh, a need to help those people. So what did they actually do? Well, there's two main laws that you need to know about. The first is the 1576 Act. The 1576 Act um, stated that... Um, local authorities had to look after the poor in their area. It didn't really state much more than that. So the only real change was that local authorities or local areas had the responsibility to look after the poor. It doesn't state what they had to do. Previously, the main actions that local areas had taken was things like if someone was caught begging, they'd put them in the stocks and throw rotten fruit at them, or they'd have a hole burned in their ear if they were caught, or they would hang people or whip people for being caught um, for begging. Um, this new law in 1576 meant that local authorities started to trial out new methods of helping the poor. For example, um, we had in York uh, a master beggar uh, who, being employed who went round and made sure he logged all of the other beggars who lived in the local area in York um, and he sent people to an area called the House of Correction if he felt like they were undeserving poor um, who should actually be in a job. Uh, in Ipswich, uh, it was the first town to open a hospital uh, for the old and the sick in the area who couldn't afford treatment. So Ipswich um, actually took much more positive action rather than just trying to send people uh, to a, a basically a form of a prison if they weren't uh, working and should have been. And Norwich was the first city to tax people in the local area to pay for poor relief. Uh, things like almshouses and places where the poor could go if they had no uh, home to go to. The 1576 Act was very varied, so in different areas, like we can see, um, there were different levels of success. And um, inspired by places like Ipswich and Norwich, in 1601, Elizabeth is persuaded by her privy councillors to uh, pass the 1601 Poor Law. And this more specifically stated what local areas had to do. So it said that um, each area of the country should tax the rich to pay for the care of the helpless um, and those who were unable to work. Um, and this led to less regional variation um, and people uh, set up more almshouses and gave more food and shelter than there had been before. 
and in fact the 1601 poor law remained in place until the 1800s. So in some ways you could say that Elizabeth's poor laws, although they came right at the end of her uh, reign, were perhaps an example of a golden age um, in that there was a step towards um, better looking after the poor um, uh, and taking responsibility for those groups of people in society who perhaps couldn't help themselves. That's the end of this uh, quick revision session looking at life Elizabethan times. Best of luck with your exam.